What's up? <laughs> I've taken to eating carrots. As you know, pardon me, I do refer to myself as little Shaul. Shaul is Hebrew for Paul. My mother has really no idea why she named me that. But there we are. Little Shaul. At one time, I was really little Shaul. Because I was really, really little. But now, I have pants that I can't well, they're too small. That was never a problem for me. Never. A long time ago, well, actually up until I was about 40, I could be flung. I mean, I probably weighed about um, 105, 6, until I was like 40. Might have got up to 110, maybe. See, I never ate candy, really. When I went trick-or-treating, I would always give my parents and my sister everything. I just wanted the gum. I just wanted gum and anything sour. Now I've got pants that won't fit. Let me show you a picture. This is a picture from when I was in seventh grade. One of the things I really used to look forward to in gym when I went was uh, we would build pyramids. And I was so tiny and light that I got to be the top of the pyramid. Look there. Look there. Some of the kids in this picture are now dead. Okay. <sighs> yeah. For, for, for years, I used to be afraid to look in our local, our little local newspaper for fear of my buddies, you know, turning up dead. <laughs> um, um, pardon the hair. Uh, yeah, um, somebody made a comment down below on the last video asking if, if the hair was real. It's real. Okay. Getting there, getting longer. But I want more. I want more. I just do. I know what, what the Apostle Paul said. Don't tell me. I know what the Apostle Paul said. And my mom often reminded me <laughs> of what the Apostle Paul said. But if you are not familiar with what he said, uh, here's what he said. From his first letter unto the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians eleven fourteen. Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? Now, of course, most folks who don't like men with long hair, they just stop right there. My mom included. She always wanted me to get my hair cut. Um, you know, you know how I feel about that. But uh, anyway, so you got to continue on. You got to continue on to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians eleven sixteen to get the crux of Paul's biscuit here. See what he goes on to say. But if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the assemblies of Elohim. So let it grow, my friends. Oh, let it grow. Now, I know that there may be those who could object to me saying such a thing, but, uh... But, you know, I was talking to my teacher, my teacher up in New Jersey, Mr. Alan Horvath, recently, and, well, look at that beautiful hair. Come on now. And by all means, if you are not sitting under his teaching of the word as I have since 2013, you simply must watch, listen, and most importantly, take to heart his body of work that has been pitching tents securely with the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for almost an entire decade here on YouTube. And you can also see him on Vimeo. I have certainly been nothing but edified, exhorted, and comforted by his excellent word studies, and I thank him, oh, I thank him so very much for recently giving me confidence for the amazingly encouraging words 
regarding what we've been doing here at the Zeus Mars Bender channel for the glory of our Abba. And Abba willing, I would love to be playing some music with this man very soon. <laughs> if not on this side, then definitely along with Asaph, the chief musician, and all those who will lead the magnificent worship in the kingdom of our master and king, Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen and Maranatha. Parrot. Yeah, right. Can't bring one for your friend. I didn't know. Like a vault. No, he's eating radishes. Go ahead, make excuse. You... Can't bring some fun, old man. My carrot. I'm going downstairs. I'm going to have two carrots and a pickle. What are you going to do? Okay, um, what was I saying with a mouthful of orange vegetable before I was rudely interrupted by a little man with a hat and mustache? I made it pick you up. I... I used to do um, hair jokes, um, biblical hair jokes, <laughs> uh, in our comedy act. Years ago, I worked with a, a gentleman by the name of Paul Schmidt, another Paul. We used to go by Paul and Paul. <laughs> we we uh, prided ourselves on our originality. And um, we used to say that uh, we used to do a, a routine about, about archaeology, and they would find... Um, artifacts, biblical artifacts, and they had found a copy of Samson's uh, hair insurance policy. You know, Absalom had a, had a policy as well. Covered everything but getting your hair caught in a tree. You know, go figure. Just like a, just like insurance policy. Hmm. Let's see. Well, I suppose I should uh, move along to um, to what the video is really uh, all about here. I guess I should say the thing. Uh, little Shaul here coming to you from FEMA region number three. I'll tell you why uh, it's called a prophecy prompter. I, I, I was thinking about calling it a prophecy alert. But I thought the prophecy prompter would be better because there are so many things... That, you, that we have to remind ourselves of. Things that kind of started to come to fruition a long time ago. Prophecy Prompter is a much better title for what we're doing here at this moment. Things that, that Laban spoke about in videos going back to 2014. Going to show you some of that. As a matter of fact, we're going to do that right now. Take a look at that. You see that? You know what that is? That is the thumbnail for a video posted way, way, oh, way back in October of 2014 called What is This? The Curse of DST. And by DST, we don't mean oh, dental surgery terror or despotic sesecto tetanto. Whatever that means. DST means this. And it is a curse. Now, I know that a lot of you have viewed this video, but for those who have not, you must. Oh, you must. I'm telling you, folks, from the very time this idiotic and thoroughly abominable act of man's thinking that he can change the times and ordinances of Elohim to suit his purposes has from its inception proven to curse this earth. Something disastrous always happens, either within a week before or after of our turning the clocks forward, or within a week before or after of our turning them back again. And sometimes it happens at both the putting forward, and the setting them back again. Anything happen this year, you may ask? Well, let's, uh, let's take a look at our recent act of falling back. Well, that's a great term anyway for us, right? Uh, falling back. On November the 5th of this year, which of course is 2017, and you tell me. On the very day of our 2017 falling back, there was this. 26 dead, 20 injured in massacre at rural Texas church in worst mass shooting in state's history. Now, for those of you out there who may be quipping, Oh, little shoal, this incident is isolated. How can daylight saving time be a curse over the whole earth? 
when things only happen in a certain part of it. Well, quippers, exactly seven, that's seven days later, there was this. Magnitude 7.3. Did you get that one? Seven, three. <laughs> Those who have eyes will see and ears will hear. 7.3 earthquake in Iran, Iraq is the deadliest of 2017. Well, well, what do you know? Iran, Iraq. Hmm. Stew on that a while. Now, there is something very important that I would like for you to notice about these two events. Something very important and, yes, very prophetic. Something that is common to these two headlines. But first, it's off to the scriptures to set it all up. Let me tell you, people, if you cannot find a scripture that adds credibility to a headline, then get rid of that headline. It's not even worth your time. Okay, to the scriptures. Oh, there they are. Love them. Let us have a look at these three scriptures right here. That's three, number of divine perfection. One, courtesy of the Ruach HaKadosh through the beloved Daniel, and one from the Apostle Paul, and one from the beloved Yohanan, that's John. Let us read Daniel 7, 25. He, that is the Antichrist, or when it comes right to it, when it comes right down to brass tacks, we're talking about the adversary here, Hashatan. He will speak against the Most High and oppress, or literally wear out, his, that is Yahuwah's, Kodesh people and try to change the set times and laws. Did you get that, my friends? Set times. Now, the passage goes on to talk about the, uh, the actual tribulation period, but this, this right here, this has been going on for 2,000 years, people. Hasatan has been doing this since Yeshua ascended unto his father from the Mount of Olives. And proof of that is found in the two scriptures below there, my friends. Two witnesses. They establish the first. Let's read 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he, that is the Ruach HaKadosh, is taken out of the way. And now from 1 John, 1 Yohanan, chapter 4, verse 3. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming, and is what? <laughs> and is what? Now! Now! Already? in the world. And that little now right there, the one in the little block, <laughs> that's not our now, people. That's John's now. The apostles Paul and John were saying the exact same thing here, my brothers and sisters. The Antichrist was already at work back then, back in their day. Now, I don't know if any kind of daylight saving time garbage was tried back in their days, but I'll tell you this, it was told to us that the plans for it were already in motion. Now, back to our headlines and their common denominator. Their common denominator, my friends, is a number, and that number is the number 10. Now, Daniel told us that the adversary would attempt to alter Elohim's ordinances, and the number 10 is the number of divine order. We got a number 10 right here, and we got a number 10 right here, and both of these disastrous events occurred at a time when we what? Set times. That's right. Now, I'm telling you folks, you got to go back and watch this video. What you learn will blow your mind. That's it for Prophecy Prompter number one. Moving on to Prophecy Prompter number two. One thing that I uh, have to bring up, I actually have a playlist <laughs> that deals with this gentleman. Um, got a call from my sister, my bio sister, and um, it prompted me to 
Check out the Drudge page. And this is what the Drudge page said when I arrived unto it. On November the 19th of 2017, Hell's Burning. <laughs> Wonder what's up with that. And, of course, when I clicked on the story, there we are. My friends, um, things are different now. Things are different because of this. You may not think so, but you'll see. This is a watershed moment in the history of the world with the passing of Charlie. Yeah, I do believe that it all goes in with the Revelation 12 sign. Paradigm shifts are gonna be just coming out the wazoo, people. <laughs> That's true. I'm sorry, but it, you know, I don't mean to put it that way, but hey, why not, right? And of course, there are the uh, obvious outcries of, oh, little Shaul, how in the world could Charlie Manson have anything to do with, with Revelation 12? Well, here's my take on it, my friends. Let me tell you why I postulate that the demise of old Charlie Boy is prophetic and even could possibly be considered a sign, and not only what the world at large calls a quote-unquote sign of the times, but a true sign that Yeshua is at the door. He is ready to come for his own. Oh, yeah. Okay, now I believe that it is very safe to say that we all recognize this person here. But if, if there's anyone out there that possibly don't, well, his name is Adolf Hitler, and until he supposedly blew his head off with a gun, he was considered by most to be what the world at large would call evil incarnate. Now, he apparently... And there is a contingent of folks who believe he may have escaped to Argentina. He apparently blew his head off in his underground prepper bunker, probably stocked up with the precursor to the stuff that uh, Jim Baker and his buddies are profiting from these days. He blew his head off, apparently, on April the 30th of 1945. Now, since then, there's been Stalin, Mao, Pol Pot, and a host of various and sundry genocidal maniacs out there throughout the, throughout the years who have been dubbed with the moniker of pure evil. However, I postulate unto you that none since old laid off here, that's right, none, not even these horrific pieces of work has come close, not even close to eliciting more fear and dread in the hearts of average folk when it comes to what they've regarded as evil incarnate than him, Charlie Manson. I suppose you can argue the fact if you want to, but uh, come on now, who else you gonna come up with? Since the day he hit the front pages of newspapers and the screens of televisions, people have pretty much equated the concept of evil on this earth with this face. And forget the face, forget the face. Just saying the name, the name conjures and still conjures up thoughts of pure satanic evil. And that has pretty much been the case since 1960 and 9. Number 9, number 9. The number of divine judgment. Anyone out there familiar with these words? From the 8th most of the Psalms, chapter 8, verse 2, out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength and quoted, quoted by our Savior himself in the Gospel of Matthew, Matithu, chapter 21, verse 16, out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise. Oh, little Shaul, why do you bring up these, these very, very famous verses? Well, please allow me to explain the reason for such. How's about we put these two photographs next to one another? Oh, isn't that lovely? Now, who killed more people? Why, Joey, of course, by far. And not just a little bit by far, way, way by far. Joey killed approximately 40 to 60 million people, something like that. Charlie, he killed nine. There's our number nine again. Now, don't get me wrong. In the eyes of our Elohim, murder is murder, no matter how many. But you bring out a five-year-old kid, and you show him these faces, which one do you think is more likely to bring on the nightlight? <laughs> Look, there's no way getting around the fact 
that for close to half a century, no other human being on this earth has been the universally accepted personification of evil like Charles Manson. And I'm talking about deep spiritual evil. Not just like somebody going around physically wiping people out, as bad as that is. I'm pretty certain that you all understand what I'm getting at. So what's the bottom line here, little Shaul? What's the bottom line? Well, the bottom line is this. He's dead. Charlie is dead and gone. And I believe with my whole heart that it is absolutely no, no coincidence that Abba saw fit to knock him off this year, the year of 2017, the year of the Revelation 12, 1 and 2 sign. Why now? Why not last year? Why not 10 years ago? Why not just let him live a little longer? Because the time has come for the veil to be lifted. Because just like Abba is about to take the restrainer out of the way, which includes we who have the indwelling of the Ruach, Abba has removed all pretenders to the throne and is about to allow the crowning of the real deal, the actual son of perdition. Everyone's perceived idea of true evil is gone. No more will there be facsimiles. No more Hitlers. No more Charlies. In fact, in comparison to what's coming down the pike, the earth dwellers will be begging for a little late off for a bit of Charlie. You see, with old Charlie boy still here, in the backs of our minuscule finite minds, we kind of thought with him all locked up in prison, we could somehow keep an eye on what we've perceived as being the personification of evil. But that luxury is gone now. He's dead. It's out of our hands. It kind of never was in our hands. But as I said before, you see what I'm getting at. Charles Manson, dead at 83. 83, pretty interesting there. 8 plus 3, that equals 11. What do we read in our, uh, in our Bullinger, our number in scripture? What does Mr. Bullinger have to say about the number 11? Let's take a look. If 10 is the number which marks the perfection of divine order, then 11 is an addition to it, subversive of and undoing that order. If 12 is the number which marks the perfection of divine government, then 11 falls short of it so that whether we regard it as being 10 plus 1 or 12 minus 1, it is the number which marks disorder, disorganization, imperfection, and disintegration. That is what's coming for the Earth Dwellers. Don't be here. Don't be here. Because in comparison to what's coming, to what's coming down to you, as it says in Revelation 12, <laughs> Charlie Manson, pretty much tad amount to Charlie Brown. Charles Manson, dead at 83. Brothers and sisters, I urge you all, if you have not yet, please, please watch the Summer of Charlie playlist. Tons of information, tons of things that'll just knock your socks off, blow your mind about this dude and um, his role that he has played in the, in, on the world stage. It can't be ignored. It cannot be dismissed. Okay, uh, we're going to get on with it. We're going to get on with it. Um, I'm allowed to say that. You know, I know it's Laban's, one of Laban's catchphrases, but he's, he's given me permission to say it with a Baltimore accent rather than with his. Okay, allow me now to prompt y'all on a report that we did over two years ago in a video called Food for Prophetic Thought Number 12, A Blustery Day Ahead. Here's Laban from November of 2015. I reported on something a while back in a video I did called Who Can It Be Now? which delved into the fact that uh, the Antichrist doesn't necessarily have to be from any particular nationality. I'll put a link to that video. But I want to show you a clip on something I reported on in that video. Here it is. Dr. Sergio Canavero claims it will be possible to transplant a human head onto another body by 2017. This gentleman right here, Valerie Spiridnov, 
says he is ready to put his trust in Dr. Canavero. The 30-year-old computer scientist was born with Verdnig Hoffman disease. Well, there you go, my friends. I did that report uh, back at the end of last April. And I got curious. I wanted to know whether Dr. Canavero was still working on this thing. And guess what? Let me tell you what. <laughs> he is. Look at that headline there. Surgeon promising first human head transplant makes pitch to U.S. doctors. Over the summer, there's the date up there, Saturday, June the 13th, 2015. Over this past summer, well, actually, it was spring, he went and had this special conference where he got all these doctors together and tried to get them on board with this thing. And you will never guess where he held this conference. Tahiti? Fiji? Pitcairn Island? No! <laughs> Approximately 35 miles from where I'm sitting right now. Annapolis, Maryland, FEMA region number three. <laughs> Get a load of that one. <laughs> he probably had a whole bunch of them Johns Hopkins doctors over there. <laughs> I, I wonder if he tried to get a hold of Ben Carson. I mean, come on, it's a head transplant for Pete's sake. <laughs> uh, boy, if it wasn't so sick, it would be quite the hoot, wouldn't it? Well, I'm going to show you a little bit of the article. Here we go. On Friday afternoon at the Western Hotel in Annapolis, Maryland, with a volunteer for a first human head transplant by his side, Dr. Sergio Canavero made a bid to recruit surgeons willing to help him perform the procedure from an audience of fellow doctors at the annual meeting of the American Academy of Neurological and Orthopedic Surgeons. So you can see right there, my friends, it was legit. It was legit. Going on. This here is a question from a nurse that was at the, at the conference. I do feel like it goes far, she said. Suppose you have a head transplant of someone who's an artist and onto someone who's not an artist. Will that person be able to make the arms and the hands still draw? Will the hands still quote unquote think? Will it think like it did before? How are all these functions going to work together? And here, here is Dr. Canavero's answer. You ready for this? I think you might want to have a seat. <laughs> Read it along with me, my friends. <laughs> this is what Dr. Canavero answered. You cut the spaghetto. You apply peg and boom. <laughs> My goodness crazy. Oh, my dear brothers and sisters, you know me. You know that I am not laughing merely out of meanness or ignorance. But can you actually fathom the idea that medical doctors and professionals of the highest esteem gathered with foreknowledge to listen and consider this, this abomination? And they're still considering it, my friends. That's right. Back to the future. Take a look at that headline. From 11 17, 17 <laughs> at 9 a.m., number 9, number 9. First human head transplant successfully performed on corpse. Sergio Canavero announces... There you go, my friends. We reported on this two years ago. Look at that original headline. Dr. Sergio Canavero claims it will be possible to transplant a human head onto another body by when? By 2017. Well, we've arrived. 2017, and well, there you go. <laughs> I'm just going to leave it there, right there, my friends. That's a prophecy prompter for you, all right. And I suppose a heads up. We're the little Russian guy waiting for his turn. <laughs> now we're going to move on to something a little more serious. In the summer of 2016, at the height of the campaign season, we posted a comprehensive, that's I mean, a very comprehensive treatise on the Zeus Mossbender channel stance on the 2016 presidential election. If you have not already watched this, or read it, I should say, I urge you to do so at your, your, your nearest opportunity. I'll leave a link below in the show more section, along with all the other videos that I feature in this prophecy prompter. 
Gotta tell you, it ruffled a few feathers in its wake. Now, why do I include this in our prophecy prompter? Well, read along with me this part of our treatise, and you'll start to pick up on where I'm going. In the quest to reconcile their participation in the election process with Scripture, there are those who are encouraged by the Republicans announcing their intentions of moving the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Take a look at the party's staunch determination in that regard. The United States has a moral and legal obligation to maintain its embassy and ambassador in Jerusalem. Immediately upon taking office. <laughs> the next Republican president will begin the process of moving the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Israel's capital, Jerusalem. That bold and reassuring promise is in the official GOP platform of the year 2000. That's right. And where, oh, where is our embassy today, my friends? In the state of Israel? Jerusalem? <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Now, let me tell you, when we put forth this treatise, we understood completely the scripture that tells us that those who bless Israel will be blessed. But we also know full well that the Almighty of hosts does not need Gentile nations to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital in order to make the fact more true. Now, let's have a look at the 2016 GOP platform and see what it said with regard to moving the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. From page 47 of the 2016 official GOP platform, we recognize Jerusalem as the eternal and indivisible capital of the Jewish state and call for the American Embassy to be moved there in fulfillment of U.S. law. <laughs> not, not out of respect for Elohim. Oh, no. Not out of love for his eternal city. Oh, no, the, the, the city where he has his name. No, it's to fulfill U.S. law. Oh, boy, there you go, Trumpies. All you Trumpies and the Dominion theologists out there. Oh, my goodness. Oh, ho. Oh, but little Shaul, have you not seen the exciting news? Have you not seen this headline? Israel expects Trump to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital within days. A day after Mike Pence says U.S. president actively considering moving embassy to Jerusalem, TV report claims Israeli officials believe announcement imminent. The Israeli government considers it extremely likely that U.S. President Donald Trump will declare in the next few days that he recognizes Jerusalem as Israel's capital and that he is instructing his officials to prepare to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem from Tel Aviv, an Israeli TV report claimed Wednesday. Yes, of course I heard the news. Of course I saw the headline. I just read it because it's in the video. But you know what? Let me tell you what. I also saw this headline from the Jerusalem Post, December 1st, 2017, two days later than the previous article. American and Israeli officials downplay reports of imminent embassy move. American, Israeli, and Jordanian officials all poured cold water on the reports that the U.S. was on the cusp of recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital and moving its embassy there from Tel Aviv. Channel 2 News reported on Wednesday that U.S. President Donald Trump may formally recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital early next week and direct his staff to prepare for moving the embassy to Jerusalem. Within hours, however, White House spokeswoman Sarah Huckabee Sanders said, this is a premature report. We have nothing to announce. Diplomatic officials in Jerusalem followed this by saying they have not heard that any announcement was imminent. Jordan's King Abdullah, currently in Washington, repeated what he has been saying for months about a possible embassy move, that it would likely set the region on fire. Ho oh, ho! And there's the kicker, my friends. There's the kicker. Because I'm going to show you something I'll bet none of you have seen. You ready? Get a load of this. Anybody out there happen to catch the congressional hearing on relocating the U.S. Embassy in Israel to Jerusalem on Wednesday, November the 8th? I did. You see that guy there? That's a Democrat. Ugh. His name is Representative Peter Welch, 
and he was asking a question. And the person he was asking was the former ambassador from Israel to the United Nations, Dory Gold, also one of the most intelligent men on earth. Listen to this question that Representative Welch asked. But I must warn you first, if you're a Trump supporter or a Dominion theologist, maybe they're the same thing, I don't know, you better gird your loins. All right, go ahead, Democrat. Uh, Ambassador Gold, uh, 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 you mentioned that President Trump made a commitment to move the Capitol. Uh, and as you, pardon me? The embassy. Uh, thank you. Uh, and as you know, uh, at around the time of his inauguration, I think at his inauguration, King Abdullah came here. And my understanding from press reports is that he personally uh, requested the president not to do that. Was President Trump wrong in accommodating the request of King Abdullah? Did you get that? Did you get that? Did you hear what that man, well, I should say, did you hear what that Democrat said? <laughs> he asked Dory Gold if he thought President Trump was wrong in accommodating the Muslim and said Muslims request not to move the embassy to Jerusalem. Apparently, and at his inauguration, after he got all these so-called Christians to vote for him because he's going to move the embassy to Jerusalem, he promises the king of Jordan that he won't. Did anyone know this? I had no clue. I had no clue that Donald Trump promised the Muslim that he wouldn't move the embassy. Did anyone else know? Oh, my goodness. So there we go. What is all the questioning about? That's all we need to know, I suppose, right? Let's hear that again. Uh, and as you know, uh, at around the time of his inauguration, I think at his inauguration, King Abdullah came here. And my understanding from press reports is that he personally uh, requested the president not to do that. Was President Trump wrong in accommodating the request of King Abdullah? There you go. <laughs> Would you have voted for the man had you known he was going to promise right behind your backs? Promised the Muslim that he wouldn't move it? That's just like Franklin Delano Antichrist promising the Saudi family not to help Israel. You know, back in 1945, remember what happened to, to Roosevelt? He died a week later after he went against the land of Elohim. That's right, one week later he went against the land of Elohim and he was struck dead. You want to hear the whole story? I'll leave a link to this video down below. Now back to the hearing. Now Ambassador Gold, he wouldn't answer the question. So the Democrat just kept at him. Now my, my question is, was President Trump wrong in accommodating that request and not moving the embassy to Jerusalem as he promised to do during the campaign? Do you think, Ambassador, that President Trump was wrong to break his promise? <laughs> ho, ho, ho. Dory Gold didn't want to answer that question. Absolutely not. He's a Trumpy. But there was one man there at this at this hearing, a man of Elohim. I believe a, a true man of Elohim. This man right here. And if Trump would have had any sense in that head of his, that's the man right there, Ambassador John Bolton, that should have been the Secretary of State of the United States. But instead, we got Rex Tillerson. Oh, come oh, man. Ambassador John Bolton, he answered the Democrat. The president was wrong in <laughs> accepting the recommendation of King Abdullah, if that's what he said and if that's right. what the president did. I appreciate your candor. I, I couldn't wait. <laughs> Let me ask you this. No, no, no. No more questions, Democrat. You shouldn't be sticking your tongue out at the ambassador anyway. Now listen to me, people. Let me just be clear about one thing. I didn't want Hillary Clinton in there. No way. But I'm also, you know, I'm leery of this dude. We gotta be careful. And I understand completely that this is the man that Elohim put in power. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he's got the right fruit on his tree. Elohim uses who he wills. And it doesn't always mean that it's a person that loves him. I mean, can you dig it? 
all those votes as a result of his pledge to Christians and Jews that he would move the U.S. Embassy in Israel to Jerusalem. Yet apparently, at his inauguration yet, he promises a Muslim that he won't. Oh, this has got Franklin Delano Antichrist and his deal with the Saudis written all over it. But hey, I could be wrong, and I hope I am. At the time of which I speak, it is Friday, December the 1st, 2017, and I'm not sure whether Rabba will have me uh, posting this video up by then or not, but old Trumpy has until Monday, December number 4, to either move the embassy to Jerusalem or sign the waiver delaying it yet again. You better wake up, Mr. President. I don't care if you're dealing with a Shiite or a Wahhabist. In the eyes of Elohim, a Muslim is a Muslim. And when you deal with the devil, it's going to come back to haunt you. Sooner or later. <laughs> now, like I said, I could be wrong, and come Monday, the embassy could be in Jerusalem, the city of Elohim. We shall see if, in Israel, Donald's allegiance lies, or if he just lies. I, I, I give up. So, got it. So, working my way down to the nub. Yeah. Um... I hope you're enjoying everything that you've seen thus far. I, um, gotta show you something. You know, there were comments down below, you know, where people leave comments about the onion that I had in the last video. I had an onion. I now have a, I have a carrot. But, um, I, I have another onion. This is not the same onion as the, this is a different onion. Yeah. I... It's a different onion. But uh, I used the other one. I fried it with taters. Yeah, I fried it with taters, and it was good. Good fried taters with onions, boy. All right, back to business. Oh, oh, oh who can it be now? Who can it be now? Oh, we all know who that is. That's Pastor J.D. Oh, yes. Calvary Chapel, Connie O'Hay. One of the men, one of the two men, Pastor J.D. Farag and old Scotty Clark. The two men that inspired old Zeus Small Spender to start this here channel. Oh, Pastor J.D. Why, little Shaul, are you showing us a picture of Pastor J.D.? Well, he's wonderful to look at. That's one thing. Uh, the other reason is because of that little block he has on the inside of his uh, screen there. The one that says Isaiah 17 and Ezekiel 38. Now, with regard to Bible prophecy and eschatological events, I do not believe that anyone would put up much of an argument if I were to conclude that these two chapters have been easily, easily the crux of many a watch person's biscuit. Lo, this past, oh, say, half a decade. <laughs> and for good reason. Oh, yes, indubitably. Isaiah 17, a chapter that gives us the assurance that Damascus, still the oldest continuously populated city on the face of the earth, will be a ruinous heap. But you know what? Let me tell you what. That's not will be a ruinous heap. That is a ruinous heap. That is a picture of Damascus, Syria, and all I see is a ruinous heap. Now, there might be some stuff down the road or whatever, but right there, I see a ruinous heap. Oh, little Shaul, are you saying that you feel that Isaiah 17 has been fulfilled? Yes. As a matter of fact, I am, and I'll tell you why. Now, up until I made this video, I was still of the train of thought that Abba had yet to deliver the final blow. The big one-two punch, sealing the deal on the part of the prophecy that says this, Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city. Now, as I was alluding, there might be the Syrian equivalent of a Trader Joe's or a Starbucks out there somewhere, and Bashar al-Assad might be sitting around in a lazy boy in his prepper bunker, maybe eating some of Jim Baker's survival food. <laughs> Dear God, it's good. But by the standards of the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that is not a city. 
Did you hear what I said? I did not say by the standards of this world. I said by the standards of the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, I understand that these verses that I'm putting up here right now refer to what we will have in the Shamaim, but those verses reflect the mind of Elohim. And, and well, according to what he tells us in these verses, this is not his idea of a city, whether it be in heaven or on earth, okay? So yes, I believe that Isaiah 17 has been fulfilled with regard to the part that says Damascus is a ruinous heap. Now, I'm not saying that it can't get worse. I'm not saying that Abba can't, you know, put in that, that last punch, you know. If they could be nuked, you know, the weapons of mass destruction that's buried under there, you know, they could go kablooey or whatever. But according to Elohim and in the mind of Elohim, his idea of a city is not what they got right now. And that's what I'm talking about. Damascus, Syria has, in fact ceased to be a city in the way that the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob intends for a city to be. Now, once again, there might be parts of Damascus that look better than this. But if you think even that is the creator of all things idea of a city, whether it be in heaven or on earth, well, you're out of your ever-loving mind. When our Adon, Yeshua HaMashiach, told us that he came to give life and to give it more abundantly, he was talking about experiencing that abundant life from that very moment. And he was giving everyone on this earth, whether it be Jew, Gentile, Democrat, everyone the opportunity to live that abundant life. And when he said abundant life, he meant spiritually, physically, and yes, even materially. Seek first his kingdom and all, all things are added, right? And he's talking about right here and right now. He's not talking about once we got to the kingdom, how can we seek the kingdom once we're there, huh? I posit that right now, that life in Damascus, Syria, is not what our Adon would consider abundant, by his standards. So yes, I say Isaiah 17 is fulfilled. Put a check mark on it and let's move on. Move on to the other one that Pastor JD's got up there, Ezekiel 38. And with regard to that, well, I'd say that things are lining up beautifully. And these two images, these two images right here and the words that accompany them attest very well to the fact that we are swiftly on the road to finding out exactly who Mr. Gog of Magog will be. And the way things appear to be shaping up, <laughs> I think it's pretty safe to say it's neither one of these bozos. So, uh, who's left in that picture? Now, remember that, uh, that old thing on Sesame Street where they would say one of these things is not like the other? Well, uh, well, don't get me wrong. I, I was not a Sesame Street kid. I was a Mr. Rogers kid, okay? All the way, 100%. Love you, Fred. But, uh, Sesame Street would do this thing and would say one of these things is not like the other. Well, one of them is not like the other. You want to take a guess? No, 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 don't take a guess. I'll tell you. I'll tell you what I think. That's why I'm doing the video. So just relax. I'll, I'll do the work. All right, now let us take a look at a list of the key nations that are mentioned in Ezekiel 38. And I kind of line them up with uh, the players that we have up here on the screen. I think once we figure out who might be who, we will discover which one is our anomaly. I'll bet that some of you already know, <laughs> but let's go. Now, before we carry on with our little deciphering game, I have to say something. This, this right here, this right here is a sick, disgusting joke. This is not what someone does who claims to be a follower of Yeshua and one who claims that he is rightfully representing others who claim the same. If this man thinks that what he is doing here in this 
picture is in the best interest of those he represents, well, he is at best a pure and unadulterated idiot, and at worst, an idolater. Which one do you want to be? He didn't represent me before he was elected to whatever it is you want to call him, and he certainly does not represent me now. This is disgusting pagan garbage, and this guy and all those who threw their lot in with him had better wake up, and wake up really soon. Okay, now. First off, we got Rosh, Meshik, and Tubal. Who could that be? Well... I think it's, uh, I think it's common knowledge amongst the watch folk. That's probably old Putin there. Yeah, let's give it to old Putin. Persia, well, 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 that's Beardo. Uh, there's no, uh, mistake in that. Ethiopia and Libya. I do not believe that these nations are represented among these six. Ah, six. Interesting number. All right, who's next? Gomer, hmm, well, it's kind of ironic that uh, old Jim Neighbors passed this week, but Gomer, um, let's see, that's pretty much considered to be Eastern Europe. Doesn't seem to have a representative here. Uh, the House of Togarma. Well, I believe that's the old buffoon. That's the buffoon Erdwan Sheba and Dedan. Okay, that's the uh, the dude with the with thing on his head, A.K.A. Saudi Arabia. And the merchants of Tarshish and all their young lions. Well, I believe that's our Mr. Trump. So who's left? Hmm, hmm, hmm. Him. And we all know where he's from, right? But if you don't, he's from here. A.K.A. Brothers and sisters, I am not saying that this is something that we should not be doing, but I believe that we're focusing so much on Isaiah 17 and Ezekiel 38 that we're seemingly forgetting all about... Yeah, Isaiah 19 and Ezekiel 29. Oh, my friends, the nation of Mitzrayim, Egypt is mentioned over 650 times in the scriptures. But not one of them, not a one of them, is in Ezekiel 38 or 39. There is no sign of Mitzrayim in the description of what goes on with this Gog Magog war. So something's gotta happen. Something's gotta happen to old Mitzrayim. And I think I might know what it is. And I don't think it has anything to do with these ISIS idiots. Oh no. On the ninth day of November 2017, of course, this headline popped up. CC to Iran. Stop meddling in the region. <laughs> That's pretty bold. And I really do believe that it could definitely spark some fireworks. And that is exactly what happened, my friends. Now, you might be saying, Oh, little Shaul, that was ISIS. They found uh, ISIS flags, or they saw people with ISIS flags. I don't care. I don't care. You don't think the Iranians can't get a hold of some ISIS flags? Or duplicate them? You know, I mean, how hard is it to make a flag? I tend to think that this was, uh, this was Iran. And the media, the mainstream media is certainly not going to tell you that it was Iran. No way. I mean, for one thing, they hate Sisi. They hate him. The UN hates him. He's a pariah in the Middle East. And man, oh man, the UN loves Iran. How dare this, this military man, this El Sisi, dare tell Iran what to do. So this would be perfect. Iran would be the perfect nation to take Mitzrayim out of play so that Gog of Magog could get underway. And keep in mind, al-Sisi and his country, well, they're mostly Sunni, and the Iranians, well, they're the Shiite. And here's something crazy. Did you ever take notice of the last name of this guy? Check it out. Al-Sisi. <laughs> Pretty wild, isn't it? <laughs> and do not forget, ISIS is Sunni. They are not Shiite, as is Iran. 
No, I uh, I gotta say that I believe that Iran is a much greater nemesis, a much greater threat to uh, Mitzrayim than these ISIS nuts. However, I think there's something else that could hurt Egypt a lot worse than Iran. Check out this clip from a video Laban posted this past April. From July of 2013, Ethiopia determined to complete them by when? <laughs> there it is. Now, who of you out there recalls when this was first reported? I certainly do, and was very surprised that none, or at least none that I know of, none of the watch folk, reported on this. Well, why didn't you, live? Why didn't you report on it? Well, let me tell you, the almighty of hosts did not call unto me to begin producing videos until the winter of 2013. Well, actually, it was late fall, but I really didn't get started until after the first of the year into 2014, so that's why. But that's beside the point. Look at that headline. Let's read what's down below there. Upon its completion in 2017, the great Ethiopian Renaissance Dam is expected to start producing 6,000 megawatts of power. This will make it the biggest hydropower project in Africa and the seventh, seventh, ho, 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 biggest in the world. Now, I also recall when this was first reported that there was an African country, another one, not Ethiopia, that was very, very upset about this. And what country was that, Lebm? Ha <laughs> ha that's right. Mitraim. Also known as... Yeah. Oh, the utter audacity of another country siphoning the precious waters of the Nile away from Egypt. Oh my goodness, unthinkable. Such a thing, Ethiopia and its horrible dame could seriously jeopardize the water supply of old Mitraim, could it not? Now let's see if the scriptures have anything to say about that. I believe they just might. It looks to me that we find pertinent information with regard to our headline from 2013 in these particular chapters of these prophetic tomes. Let's see what they have to tell us now that we are in the year of this Dam of Cush, 2017, the year of its proposed completion. Now, what you're seeing up on the screen right there is just a drop in the bucket. No pun intended. Well, what if it is? Who cares? What I'm saying here is that these few verses simply touch on what these prophetic books have to say with regard to these two integral end times nations, Egypt and Ethiopia. Let's read Isaiah 11, 15, and chapter 19, verses 5 through 8. And Yahweh shall put under the ban that is destroyed, the tongue of the sea of Mitzrayim that is of course Egypt, and he shall wave his hand over the river with the might of his roach, and shall smite it in the seven streams, and shall cause to tread it in sandals. But it's that saying there, it's saying it's going to be so shallow you can walk across it dry shod. Chapter 19, verses 5 through 8. And the waters shall fail from the sea, and the river wasted and dried up. Can't get clearer than that, can you? Verse 6. And the rivers shall stink, and the stream shall be weak and dried up. There it is, repeated again. That's very important. Reeds and rushes shall wither. Fair places by the river, by the mouth of the river, and every field by the river shall wither. Again, a repeat. And it shall be driven away and be no more. Ho, ho, ho. What is Isaiah telling us? Something's going to happen. There are rivers of Mitzrayim. Now let's see what Ezekiel, Hezekiel, has to say. Chapter 29, verses 9 and 10. And the land of Mitzrayim shall become a desert and a waste. Well, that's pretty clear. And they shall know that I am Yahweh, because he, that is Pharaoh, said, The river is mine, I have made it. Verse 10. Therefore see, I am against you and against your rivers, and shall make the land of Mitzrayim an utter waste and a desert, from Migdal to Siena, as far as the border of Cush. And what, pray tell, is Cush? Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! A Fritzy pop for the word of Elohim! Now, I don't know exactly what's going to happen with this dam when it's, when it's going to be up and running and all that. The article didn't say. 
But what is certain is that the fact that this thing exists is just more proof that the word of Elohim is right on the money and can be counted on to provide truth, truth, and nothing but the truth. Now, Laban made that report back in April of this year. Back in April, we didn't know a whole lot of what was going to go on with this thing, with this dam. But there has been a development. And, uh, well, take a look at this. From the Times of Israel, November 18th, 2017. Egypt warns Ethiopia Nile Dam dispute is life or death. Oh my goodness, friends. So there you go. <laughs> Don't be thinking that Isaiah 17 and Ezekiel 38 are the only ones falling into place. Isaiah 19 and Ezekiel 29, well, those two are doing just fine. My friends, Egypt doesn't even figure in to the Gog Magog War. Something's gotta happen to get them out of the way. And looky there, looky there. And Ethiopia, well, as you know, that's one of the uh, one of the major players in Ezekiel 38 and 39. So we got it going on here, folks. We got it going on, and that right there is your prophecy prompter. Well, there we are, my brothers and sisters. Uh, the carrot, the carrot is is gone. I've uh, consumed the entire carrot, and I hope that what um, what we have provided here for you to consume by way of this video was as as we wish we wish for you to be uh, edified exhorted and most importantly comforted that's what it's all about to be comforted in these perilous times it's close it's close my brothers and sisters there are such attacks the adversary He's running out of time. He's running out of time. And he's going to come at you. No doubt about it. And let us, as my teacher, <laughs> my teacher, my brother, my friend, Alan Horvath would say, let's bow our hearts, pitch a tent with our Elohim. Oh, Elohim. Elohim and the Shamaim, we thank you. We thank you above all for being, being our all in all. We long to be with you. Oh, Father, we ask, we ask you to, to be with us through all things, to be with us as we go about our day. Give us the, give us the, the, the knowledge, give us the wisdom to know that we should pray with every step we take. To everything we do, if we take medicine when we eat, when we lay down to sleep, let us just for seek your counsel. Seek your counsel in all things, in everything. There is no such thing as even a small matter where we should not seek your counsel first. I just want to come before you in humility and obedience, for all pride just has to be done away with. Pride, pride, the sin of sins. I know that all sin is, is sin in your eyes, but pride, <laughs> that's the one, that's the one. The fear of you, that's just the beginning, the beginning of wisdom. But oh, <laughs> what a beginning. And Father, we just... We just pray all of this. We pray all of this in your son's Kodesh name, his holy name, the name above all names, Yeshua HaMashiach. And we say amen. And Maranatha.